Hello, everyone. Welcome to IPDAY's Webinar Wednesday. I'm June Rawl, the director of IPDAY, and today I'm joined by two of my fellow colleagues from Seminole State College. Dr. Joe Houston is an educator, administrator, and speaker who promotes an adaptive and collaborative leadership perspective, prioritizing a culture of inclusion, communication, and innovation. He currently serves as the Dean of Adult and Workforce Education at Seminole State College of Florida and is the president of Strategic Innovations and Research Network, where he advocates for the establishment of a supportive and collaborative partnership development. Welcome, Dr. Houston. Along with Joe, we have Elaine Caggiano, Elaine joined Seminole State College in 2006 after she switched gears from healthcare to higher education. For more than a decade, she served as a coordinator for Seminole State College's STAR Center, a program devoted to developing and implementing customized support plans for workforce education students, bringing them across the finish line with industry certification and career placement. In 2021, Elaine accepted a program coordinator position within Seminole State College Center for adult and uh, adult education and workforce education, where she continues to ensure service excellence in responding to the needs of students and the surrounding communities. I know we have two experts in the field today to facilitate our webinar. Let me give you a brief description of what you're going to embark on. Today's webinar, Implementing an Interest-Based Approach to Regional Partnership Development. Over the past six months, we have all made really great strides and progress in advancing our regional part planning. As we wait for the new RFP format to arrive this spring, now is a great time to invest further in discussing how we will accomplish our work and work together with a regional service delivery model. I think in today's webinar, you're going to find a lot of good strategic comments and ways that we can do this. This is um, the first of a three-part series, and it's really going to be addressing management, innovation, and negotiation within our regional partnerships. Before we get started, I am going to remind you of a few housekeeping rules. You know that you are all on, your microphones are muted please, please, please interact with us today. Put your questions in the Q&A option that's on your screen. Uh, Joe and Elaine will be monitoring that, and I will as well, and the department is on the call too, to answer any of your questions that you may have. No question is, is not going to be anything that we won't want to really talk to you about. So today's presentation is recorded. It will be archived on the IPTE website within 48 hours. The PowerPoint is already up on the website, so you'll able to have access to it if you haven't already done so. So with all that being said, I am going to turn it over now to Joe and Elaine, and I want to thank you very much for conducting and facilitating this webinar for us today. Wow. Well, uh, thank you, June, and, and thanks, everyone. We appreciate the opportunity to be here today and uh, appreciate you all spending some time with us. As June indicated, uh, your main way to communicate with us is going to be through the chat and the Q&A features. Um, so let's take advantage of that right now and let's get started. Uh, while we look over our objectives, take a moment, introduce yourself in the chat by adding your name, your organization. If you know what region you're from, throw that in there too. Elaine is largely going to be managing the chat and the Q&A rooms. Uh, we have two planned stops during the webinar to address questions, so please feel encouraged, drop questions in the Q&A, and we'll strive to address those. Uh, any questions we don't get to during the Q&A stops, we'll strive to address offline with you directly. So, hey, listen, Elaine thought she was going to be running the Q&A in the chat, and that would be less work. So let's overload her, guys. Fill up that chat. So let us know who's out there. <laughs> All right. So our objectives today, our goals are really just to take a moment, and we're going to be reflective about the work that we've done for the past six months, and, and really to take stock of where we're at at this moment as we prepare uh, moving forward with regionalization. So I'm going to age myself here just a little bit. All right. Anybody out there remember MTV? 
And uh, this is one of those MTV moments. You guys, you remember that that show, Real World? This was like it's like 25 years ago or something. So uh, their slogan was something like, "What happens when people stop being nice and start getting real?" And I, I feel like that's the precipice that we're standing on with regionalization. If you've been doing this work, you know, as we move forward here, the RFP lands at some point here in our near future, and um, you know, you've had a lot of great conversations for the past few months, and and to that end. Our goal is to share a model today that we call the interest-based partnership development model. And we've had a lot of good success in our work as facilitators um, in the bargaining and partnership development space for the past few years using this model. And what you can see from this list of objectives is, you know, we'd like for you to walk away with a sense of the differences between interest-based and position-based negotiation. And we'd like to identify some of your core areas of challenge or concern moving forward. But we'd also like you to understand how this interest-based model that we're talking about could be applied to the work that's coming up with regards to regionalization. Now, before we jump into the model itself, we think we have a little bit of background information that we need to cover for context. So first, you've got to understand that in any given room, you're the only person with your unique experiences in education, with your specific work history. And to that end, you're an expert with your unique uh, perspective drawing from those experiences. So in an effective partnership, it's less about leaders with power dictating action. And it's more about drawing from the strengths of all of our team members. So why we frame your positionality in regionalization this way as an expert is because in order for all of us to get what we want, we're all gonna be compelled to negotiate and to contribute into our collaborative discussions. So in addition to being an expert, whether you like it or not, you're going to be a negotiator. And what we've observed over the past decade is that there's a revolution in the field of negotiation and collaboration work that's been shifting towards these networks of negotiation where people with diverse backgrounds and experiences have to come together and mutually work together to address challenges. And to me, that kind of sounds like a pretty good description of our regionalization work. For many people, though, the idea of negotiating with our peers, with our colleagues, it kind of has an adversarial connotation because it's, it's common to think in terms of who's going to win and who's going to lose in a negotiation. To me, like people think about negotiation in the context of having a struggle or a conflict. It's like they're battling a salesperson to negotiate the price of a car. And, and people tend to think about negotiation this way because, you know, bargaining can often uh, be derailed with things like pressure tactics, political maneuvering, the drive to score points against the other side. You know, people tend to see a zero sum perspective of negotiation. And we think that's entirely wrong because it comes from a place of understanding that there's a fixed pie and we all have to fight for it, where a win for one person has to be a loss for another. The reality, though, in our world of education is that it's seldom a fixed pie, it's really usually an illusion. At the same time, like, look, we're not so naive as to say there's always a win-win in every negotiation, but rather than thinking in these binary contexts, I want all of you to, to feel like you can start thinking towards developing what we term wise agreements. And this is where we get an arrangement that serves to meet the interests of each party in a group. This is an agreement that's it's better for both parties or for multiple parties than what any of us could come up with as an alternative working individually. Additionally, you know, part of the revolution in negotiation is about this move away from positional bargaining. And if you scan any no news outlet today, like you're going to see there's a lot of room for improvement in the way that we collaborate and work together, right, as a human species. Uh, we see stubborn bargaining tactics are alive and well in our labor relations. Uh, we see ugly battles going on internationally. Uh, look, don't even get us started on politics, right? <laughs> so that whole landscape is just rife with these positional bargaining moments where people are in bitter conflicts. They're battling each other. They're getting into escalations. And so, you know, what we term as positional bargaining, we'll describe a little bit in more detail. Um, but in essence, it accepts the premise where it's fine to destroy relationships in order to get what you want. Right. And for us, we want to propose a better way for all of us to conduct our regional work which is through an interest-based approach to developing partnerships where relationships matter 
because we're going to have to work together long term. All right, so look, there's a lot of different places that we could encounter conflict in every partnership that we encounter. And on this screen, you'll see like we've listed a few areas where we think some conflict or challenge could arise in regionalization. I mean, to be clear, it's not gonna be our goal to eliminate conflict with each other. That's simply not possible, but rather our goal should be about establishing a process that lets us work through our conflict collaboratively. It lets us work together in a way that generates innovative solutions that, that meets all of our needs. So these conflicts are going to arise and they're likely to come from these sources, but probably others. So Elaine looks like she's getting sleepy over here. Let's, in the chat, where do you see in your work some of the potential conflicts that might arise in our regionalization work? Where do you think some of the challenges are gonna be? Yeah, so geography is definitely going to be a challenge. And, you know, interestingly, some of our regions are more geographically dispersed than others. And we have rural districts with, you know, a large geographic span. And then we have urban districts that are pretty densely together. So, um, yeah, definitely. It looks like some folks have talked about some legal issues. So I, I do expect we're going to have a lot of MOUs and different agreements. And I think all of our legal departments are going to be pretty busy. And uh, okay, so I see resources have come up. So we're definitely gonna talk about resources here in a couple of minutes as well. So, I mean, look, this is our reality, right? That partnerships and collaboration work, it's hard for, for the reasons you're listing here and a lot others. Um, you know, and, and one of the key challenges right now in our regionalization effort is that as a field, I mean, we've been encouraged to engage in problem solving and plan development, and that's really good. But at the same time, we feel like we really haven't paused to take time to consider how best we're actually going to do this work. How are we going to really work together as, you know, in the context of when these challenges um, are confronting us? All right, so we feel like we need a framework. And our goal here today is to kind of deliver an option for that framework. You know, we were convened in fairly fast order this past summer, and, and we were driven through a pre-scheduled agenda to arrive at some action plans this December. And you know, this initiative had all of us you know, kind of rapidly moving towards what we want to do. You know, with that though, we feel like there wasn't as much attention given to how we're going to do it. And, and right now, as, as June said at the beginning, this is a perfect time to have that discussion of how we're gonna do that work. So up to this point, we really haven't been dealing with real money, somebody just put in here, you know, the timing of the, the RFP release is a challenge. We haven't really had real tasks. Um, we're not even sure that everybody fully understands regionalization in, in itself. And so the idea that we were coming through putting together some, some plans and thinking about what work we're going to do, um, you know, we need to be talking about how we're going to get there. So you know, as Ashley noted when we were up in Flagler in December, what we're coming into is is largely a financial agreement in this first round of regionalization. In order to get there, though, as, as things kind of get real, you know, we're going to need to formalize some organizing structures, and people have been talking about that. You know, a lot of folks have been talking about regional councils and regional committees. We really like that structure. We think it makes a lot of sense, but you're also going to need an operating agreement. And, you know, to get there, we're going to have a whole lot of MOUs flying around. You know, somebody just said some legal issues. And out of that, <laughs> we're going to wind up with these initial, initial agreement documents. We have to have a process for amending all of these documents. We've got to have a way to implement our plans. You know, so all of this comes together, and I've got a little surprise for you guys. Hey, this is all going to require bargaining and negotiation. And so that's the whole point of our conversation today. You know, so to that end, we need a process that helps to neutralize detrimental power dynamics and something that can help to prevent you know, non-productive tactics that we see in negotiations all the time from derailing the progress we make within our regions. So to that end, I told you we would spell out a little more about what we're calling positional bargaining. And in reality, positional bargaining, it's, it's what you see every day in our culture. Um, people see themselves as adversaries in combat against one another. And that, that happens because we place a lot of value on positions and what we want. And in the interest-based approach, 
you know, we're adopting a mutually agreed upon model where we align ourselves with our fellow participants and we're not fighting against each other, but rather we're mutually com combating the problems we face or the challenges we face in our regions. As a model, interest-based bargaining confronts this natural human tendency to immediately jump into competition and you know, to fight for what we want. And instead, it helps us to become wise problem solvers, to actually look at the problems, but also to look at our respective interests and the interests that our colleagues have as we face these challenges in our regions. By realigning our focus, what we're really doing here is instead of trying to achieve victory over each other, we're trying to achieve agreement and doing it in a way that helps all of our programs become improved programs over time. We're finding mutually beneficial agreements. And I, I think one of the things, Joe, that, that we find is we're so steeped in this behavior from you know, all, all of the different um, positions that we've had that it's, it's difficult to see that there's even another opportunity. Like we are trying to reach a mutual agreement, but we still, what's in it for us? Or are we getting it shorted? And it's, it's hard to even see that there's another opportunity to, to build partnerships and negotiate in a different way. Yeah, it's a good point. So, you know, a lot of apprehension comes around change and especially change as significant as this. So, you know, finding a way for us to create a model to work within helps alleviate some of that apprehension because there's a safeguard when we have the way that we're gonna to work together within this model. So, you know, one of the central problems with positional bargaining is kind of what Elaine's alluding to, you know, we're looking to maximize our own personal gains and minimize our own personal losses. But under an interest-based model, what we're looking at is creating a maximum number of options for all of us to choose from and to work within. Uh, you know, so look, we have larger regions, we have smaller regions. And when I say that, you know, I think the folks who put that into the chat, I mean, we're talking in terms of geography, student headcount, operating revenues, numbers of employees, you know, but instead of approaching our work together from a place of positionality and, and a place of fear about people wielding their power against us, you know, an interest-based approach seeks to leverage the value of all of our diverse operations and, and lets us cultivate a maximum number of options to do our work. Yeah. You know, in traditional bargaining, a lot of the work that we do is, you know, if you think about going and buying a car or buying a house, like we're fighting against the other side and we're demanding they make concessions, come down to my price. But in those positional bargaining situations, you know, if you go buy a car, you're not going to see that dealership again for maybe 10 years if you ever even go back. So relationships don't really matter. For us in a regional model, we're working with our peers for years at a time here. Mm -hmm. And these are our colleagues. They're our partners in this. And so we need to be looking to seek mutual benefit instead of trying to defeat one another. And that brings in this idea of trust. A positional bargaining model, it really stems from a place of mistrust. You know, when we get into a, a situation where we're, we're trying to buy something from a transaction, you know, we know that person's trying to get the most money out of us as possible. So we kind of distrust them. And they do the same with us. We know we're going to try to get the lowest possible price po uh, that we can. And, and so there's a mistrust there. But when we're forming partnerships, you know, we want to disclose all of our positions with each other. We're here as a team trying to help each other make our programs better. And so the interest-based model infuses trust with one another. So why we think this interest-based partnership model is the right thing for regionalization is not only because of that long-term relationship that we need, but because, you know, a lot of the challenges that we face in our field can appear significant and sometimes insurmountable. But the reality is that by all of us coming together to address that, you know, we're going to be moving in parallel paths anyway to solve a lot of our problems. Right. But by coming together, we're able to magnify our ability to overcome challenges because we're all moving in the same direction and we get the power of all of our resources pulled together. And so we're going to develop really great relationships with our colleagues within our regions, and we're going to get a better understanding of the, the needs that our organizations have what our capabilities are together, and it helps us to make collaborative decisions where, you know, we're going to wind up with a, a significant improvement over our outcomes than if we were all fighting against each other anyways. So uh, we get better problem solving, better innovation, and by getting a commitment together in this interest-based model, we're going to be in a much better collaborative place for us to be able to move forward over the years you know, working through relationships as opposed to feeling like we're constantly battling against each other. So the interest-based model has a lot of value when you're looking for long-term relationships. 
Now, that being said, you know, it all sounds nice, you know, and, and everyone's gonna, gonna get along and, and live this copacetic life, but, you know, it definitely doesn't happen automatically, right? So uh, plenty of research on negotiation shows that, you know, it's more in line with human nature to be destructive and combative in negotiations, and we see this all the time. You know, so we've helped facilitate partnerships and, and negotiations many times, you know, sometimes from the very beginning of a partnership, and sometimes we're brought in after parties have struggled to find common ground together. But in either case, one of the central ways that we're able to help groups move forward is by having the teams come together and develop a central set of ground rules for how they're going to engage with each other. And our suggestion is for these to be pre-established where the group comes together to co-create their set of rules. You know, we like to kind of use this interest-based model, which we'll, we'll showcase here in a minute. The first opportunity for using it is really in setting up these ground rules. And by co-creating the rules within your region, all the participants are building relationships together and they're developing ownership for this model. It, it lets them garner a lot of buy-in. And down the line, when things start to get real, as our MTV folks would say, in their negotiations, the members are going to be able to, you know, keep everyone in line with the established rules, and it helps prevent the talks from going off the rails with some of those unfortunate maneuvers that people sometimes make. So, you know, a couple of ideas, you know, you see towards the bottom of the screen, these are some of the areas that we like to see people developing ground rules for their negotiations and their partnership work. You know, it's less about the total number of rules. We've been in, in facilitation of groups where they'll have 20 or more ground rules for their partnership. It's really not about the number. The rules need to have a purpose and, and you know, help the group move towards being productive and respectful in their work together. So um, a few good examples and you know, people like tangible examples. So here's a few of the ground rules we've kind of seen some of the groups make before that we've liked. Um, one of them is all titles and positions are left at the door. So in those sessions, you know, people refer to each other by their first name and, you know, that goes a long ways for helping with relationships and, and it removes the idea of authority and, and power out of the group. Um, another one is, it's okay to disagree, but we're not gonna allow personal attacks. So you'll hear Elaine and I talk about, we need to separate people from the problem in our negotiations. It's okay if we disagree with each other, but when we take things personal, that's when you know, emotions start getting high and people start shutting down. Um, we've seen a rule that says, be respectful of the person who has the floor when they're talking and raise your hand when, it's, when you wanna speak next instead of having people talk over, over top of each other. Um, and one of my favorites is that any agreements that are made are made by the entire group and all decisions will be made by mutual consensus. You know, and that's really the essence of interest-based bargaining. It's getting us all to a place where we can agree in commonality on what we're gonna do moving forward. All right, so we've referenced a little bit about this interest-based model and that it's you know, really a communication paradigm. We've highlighted a few of the characteristics, but it's important to showcase that the communication paradigm operates on four essential principles. So the parties that are coming together, they're gonna to remain engaged for quite some time. And what we're really building here is you know, a bunch of relationships and those need to be predicated on trust. We're in this for the long haul. And it's natural for individuals to kind of inadvertently fall back into some you know, unproductive communication patterns, right? But blaming people or, or seeking to establish or defend positions, that winds up being destructive in our partnerships. And so in this model, we trust each other. Um, there's this relational element where we wanna situate participants to be friendly with each other. Um, this is kind of in stark contrast to what we see from the transactional model that we live every day. And, and you've seen this in your own work, right? When, when people talk about their workplaces being in silos, that's really what they're talking about is, you know, transactional models are at play and it's hard to get anything done across different groups. Under a relational model, we're working collaboratively, we're working together towards a common cause. Uh, we've talked a little bit about better conversations. It's just important to note that's one of the pillars of this program. And you know, lastly, it's critical to keep in our minds that we're constantly looking for opportunities for alignment with our colleagues. And I understand like you're not going to totally agree with everything your colleagues say. This model accepts that. It embraces that reality. But rather than dwell on our differences of, of opinion or our different perspectives, we're encouraged to seek a deeper understanding for where we actually agree and where our interests align. Because it's within alignment, that's where we're gonna find fertile territory for innovation together. 
All right, there's a couple of techniques that we like to use. So the interest-based model, which we're gonna show here in just a second to you, um, it's an iterative process. And you'll see that you know there's six steps to it and we can go back through those steps over and over and over again, however long it takes for us to come to agreement. In it, we're always listening to each other for understanding, which is kind of in stark contrast for you know trying to make a point or just waiting for your turn to talk. We really wanna understand where the other people are coming from because when we understand their interests, that's where we can innovate and figure out solutions that work for them as well as us. We're always working to build consensus. So where we can find ways to collaborate and um, come up with ideas that serve multiple people's needs, that's the direction we want to head towards. And of course, the entire process is a creative one. So you know, people generally feel pretty um, happy and they, they enjoy themselves working through an interest-based model. Um, as opposed to maybe some of the anxiety and apprehension we feel when we get into you know, some combative negotiations here. So, all right, so this is really laying the groundwork for us here, um, but I think we're gonna take a pause here. We've gone through quite a bit of content and uh, you guys have had an opportunity to throw things in the Q and A. If you've got any questions thus far about some of the ideas before we go into the model, um, feel free to hit the chat up and, and Elaine, I think she needs something to do over here. So throw some questions at her guys. Help me. <laughs> Oh, come on. I know there's many of you out there. You must have a question or two. Okay. All right. All right. Well, we've got a couple here. All right. Um, we've got one question about, is there ever a time where positional bargaining makes more sense? Okay, so positional bargaining is, it's a combative way of engaging with people. You see positional bargaining, if any of your organizations have unions, a lot of times what you'll see is positional bargaining when labor unions fight against management and it's usually for salaries. That's usually what gets the most airtime. And I don't know if you've ever been in any of these sessions. I mean, sometimes they can get pretty heated and people are swearing at each other and yelling at each other and your mama and things get crazy and positional bargaining sometimes. Um, I would say positional bargaining has its place if you're looking for a transaction. If you're only gonna have a single engagement with somebody like buying a car, or buying a house, we might engage um, in a transactional engagement um, under our IETs. If I need to purchase equipment and I'm going to a vendor, I'm probably going to try to beat that vendor up pretty good to get a lower price on the equipment because I know I'm not going to need to go back and buy anything again in the future. Um, so it, it's usually when it's okay to have combative engagements with each other, when it's important that you kind of force your way into things and you really don't care what the other person thinks of you. Um, but you know, our regional work is all about partnerships and long-term relationships. So we feel that positional bargaining would be really destructive in a regional environment, but good question. So we have um, two that are kind of similar. So I'm gonna A and B it. The first one says, uh, what about someone in my region who acts like just because they're from the larger provider, they're in charge of everything. And then another person is asking, how does that model handle when somebody just won't budge from a positional standpoint? Okay, so there are two similar questions, but um, as you'll see in a minute, they're, they're actually a little bit different in the nuance. Okay, so the model itself takes care of the second case where a person simply won't budge on their position. Um, we'll see in the model how interest-based bargaining really doesn't allow that to happen. Um, the first case where you have somebody come in, um, I'm going to reframe your question a little bit. Um, you're, you seem concerned with power dynamics. So they said something like, we've got a a person from a large region that kind of wants to come in and, and just kind of give ultimatums or mandates, right? So, you know, we see a lot of those power dynamics at play in partnership initiatives, especially when it's like non-voluntary, things like mergers and acquisitions. Um, and I guess in a way, regionalization could be viewed a little bit like that. Um, but look, how you negotiate and how you prepare to engage with your colleagues can make a huge difference no matter what their relative strengths are for each party. So the fact that someone comes from a large district, okay, so they have resources, right? They'll probably have a larger operating budget. They have more personnel, but keep in mind that having more resources 
isn't necessarily equivalent to having negotiation power in a regionalization effort. Mm -hmm. So my first suggestion really would be, don't even think about who's more powerful. It really doesn't matter. When you stick to the interest-based bargaining process, you can overcome an aggressive partner by asking why questions. If they stick to their guns and they're gonna try to force their will, ask them, why does it matter that we do it that way? Or why do you feel that's the best solution for addressing all of the group's interests? And what you're going to see in a minute is that the model kind of invites all the members to co-innovate. Everyone has equal footing at this. Um, and the model also has an evaluation phase that helps all of us gauge the merits of what people propose. So just because someone's from a large district and they kind of come in and they want to, uh, you know, I'm just going to say boss everybody around. It's not a nice way to say it, but if that's the sense that you're getting, this interest-based model really would do a lot of good for you because it neutralizes some of those um, those power dynamics. But you know, I, I think really where that comes from is probably, you know, some of the uncertainty around this whole process. And you know, the real power in a thriving regional partnership, it's going to come from relationships, not resources. And we're going to talk, you know, pretty extensively about negotiation conflicts during our third session. June said this was a three-part series. And that's going to be on March 1st. So, you know, that'll be a fun one. We're going to talk about all kinds of conflict problems, bad behaviors, power tactics. So you don't want to miss that one. We'll have some fireworks there and we'll get in, in a little bit deeper. But let's kind of hop into the model here because I think um, I think that'll help uh, shine a light on some of how this, uh, how this works. Okay, so this right here is the interest-based partnership development model. It has six phases. It starts at the top with issues and then it rolls clockwise around interests, constraints, options, evaluation, and commitment. So this is a recursive model. We can bounce back and forth from any of the phases at any time. And in general, what we're doing here is seeking to create an agreement or, you know, we're going to be working towards guiding documents or, you know, maybe we're building a, a, a series of MOUs or we need a contract or we're working on what our plans are going to be to, you know, move forward with these great ideas we've heard about for the past few months, you know, all of those agreements or documents, they typically contain lots of different elements. And, you know, when you get complex arrangements like these regional partnerships are going to be, this model, it winds up being applied as an overarching communication plan for how we work together to come to agreement on every single element of our plan. So let's take a minute here. We're going to go through each of these six phases and, you know, keep in mind that within this process, any prior phase can be revisited at any time. Okay, so what we do in this model is rather than coming right out of the gate saying, here's what I want to do, it says, look, let's, let's pick a topic that we want to talk about and we're going to start building a narrative around that with specific issues. So a minute ago, um, somebody brought up like student recruitment was a potential challenge or an area that we could innovate in. So maybe that's an area that your region wants to look at. What would be some of the issues around recruitment? And when we get into these issues conversations, this is how we start off, okay? So the group, your region, let's say we wanna talk about recruiting students. So we talk about what's happened so far and when did things happen? Who's been involved? What are the trends? We're building a narrative here. We're telling a story about recruitment, about enrollment. Um, and in this issues phase, we're trying to lay out the whole environment around a topic before we start diving down into what we wanna do. In our case, student recruitment, well, okay, so we can discuss things like the employment environment. What's unemployment like in our, in our local areas? What have our enrollment trends been? What's our headcount targets? How many students could you actually handle? Um, you know, so we're describing the landscape of enrollment and recruitment in this phase. The important thing here is we're describing it. We're not blaming people for it. You know, expressing concerns from a first person perspective, that's good because it helps us understand your situation. But it's also loaded language, and we, we've got to be careful about um, coming in and putting too much emotion in this. Issues, um, they're here to clarify. We want to seek what people's perceptions are. We want to understand the background about a problem. We want to ask some probing questions for our colleagues. We suggest using a charting system. It helps to track issues um, as people describe them, and, and it helps us to build a narrative that we can you know, really use to be helpful about guiding our work. Issues are neutral. We're not trying to come up with opportunities to accuse people or take a jab at a situation. 
blaming people. It's all irrelevant to this process. We're simply building a story around the existing situation, or in our case, about recruitment and enrollment. What's the problem? What are we trying to solve? Um, and, and this kind of way of thinking, it can really help conceptually to think about issues as just stating what the problem is that we're all going to be trying to address. Um, some examples uh, of some of these factual statements for issues, things like, hey, there's low educational attainment in this zip code. Do you see how there's no emotion in that? Yeah. It's just a fact. It's just a statement. Hey, we're experiencing high turnover among our advising staff. We're just stating the problem. Local electrical contractors can't find qualified workers. Right? These are examples of issues. Um, and all of them, they're, they're the goal of an issue statement is just to describe a situation. Once we understand what we're talking about, though, we roll into the second phase, which is our interests. And a lot of times we talk about these things at the same time. Honestly, like we can't help ourselves. When we name an issue, we're going to say why we care about it too. And that's what interests are. Interests are all about why you care about a particular situation and what you care about in solving it. So in naming your critical interests, this is probably the single most important thing we do in this model. So these are going to include elements like what's your motivation? What are your needs? What are your concerns? What are your fears? It's okay to have some emotion when we're talking about our interests, because this is what you want and why you want it. Um, but at the same time, we should be helping the group in this partnership move towards an understanding of what everyone's critical concerns are that we need to address with any proposals that we bring to the table. And these interests, they help us to clarify the way that we're gonna address a problem. Our goal here is to seek alignment. And integrating all of the party's interests are going to help us do that in a way that serves the whole region. We really want to avoid position statements, though. So here's what a position is. We, I think we've all kind of talked about positions lead us down the pathway of beating each other up. So we want to avoid assertions. We want to avoid making claims. Here's what a position statement would look like. I'm, you know, I've been a classroom teacher for 20 years, so I'll just I'll, I'll come from that perspective. I might go to my dean and say, I cannot teach classes starting after 2 p.m. Stop trying to schedule me for the afternoon classes. A position statement like that removes all options away from the table. It's just saying, look, I can't teach after 2. Um, maybe another position statement I've heard as an administrator, someone will go to HR and say, I have got to hire a full-time program specialist. Right? You're telling me what you want, but I really don't have a sense of why you want it, and it removes all of our ability to innovate when we come at this with positions. So what we wanna focus on are interests. Why do I want those things? All right, so maybe I said I can't teach a class after 2 p.m., but my interest is really, look, I wanna be at home when my school-age kids arrive home in the afternoon. Well, okay, if I had said it that way, maybe we have some options. There's online classes and hybrid classes, and there's other things that we could do to innovate where I could be home um, and, and be there for my kids, but still be able to teach classes. Um, here's an interest. It's important that salary adjustments keep pace with cost of living. <laughs> Sorry. Any, anybody dealing with that out there? All right, so that's an interest. Maybe another interest would be something like, we wanna ensure our faculty are up to date with best practices in the field. All right, so when people make position statements, it's hard to hear them sometimes because we're so used to people demanding things and asking for what they want, but you usually know one when it leads you into a dead end where it's just a binary. You either accept what they said or there's no other option. You have to accept what they said. Um, you can get those to turn around into interest statements by simply asking why questions. Um, so, you know, when we're facing or, or facilitating some of the um, partnership development conversations we've done, we like to use a charting system. So uh, we've created a system that tracks people's interests for all the parties. And as, uh, you know, it's kind of like a brainstorming session among the whole region of uh, you know, why does this particular topic, we use recruiting, uh, why, why does that matter? What do you care about in there and, and why do you care about it? And by cultivating a big list of everybody's interests, it lets us move forward with our process. At the same time though, you know, a lot of our work um, that we've ever done in bargaining and facilitation, you know, we encounter what we like to characterize as idealism. And that happens a lot when people jump right into what they want to do. And that's, you know, wishful thinking and, and kind of dream seeking. And it's okay to have, you know, a best case scenario 
in the back of your mind. But the reality is, unfortunately, look, we're going to be constrained by a lot of different factors. And we talked about some of those. So there is a phase baked into this model that talks about constraints. Um, so you guys have hit on a few of those I put in here. If anyone wants to add any additional constraints, you know, we hit on some, some of the challenges earlier. You know, what kind of constraints do you see in your region? Feel free to drop those in the chat. Give Elaine something to do. Yes, please. And, um, you know, so some of the external factors are definitely going to uh, be at play here. We can't change some of the legislation and regulation limitations. In a way, we can't change a lot of what our budget limitations are. But in this process, we want to recognize and acknowledge what the constraints are. But we also want to be mindful to identify which constraints are we facing that are external to us, like legislation, but which ones are we imposing upon ourselves through our own practices and the ways that we've always done things. So having a conversation about constraints can really be helpful to create those two lists. Which ones are immovable and which ones do we have control over and maybe we can, we can innovate around it. When we get down into evaluation in a minute, we'll circle back on constraints. All right. So after we talk about constraints, it now like all of this work we've done in these first three phases, it helps to move us into the fun part of this project where we get to be creative. Phase four is all about options. And this is really what everyone likes to jump right into. But if you don't have a list of interests and you haven't talked about constraints and you jump right at options, you could wind up chasing your tail in a non-productive direction. So you know, this is where our work pays off. This is a great brainstorming opportunity. We come up with all kinds of crazy ideas because nothing's off limits here. Shoot for the moon, be creative, propose ideas openly. Um, we want to incorporate interests into our idea creation. Um, and, and, you know, irrespective of constraints, we're not going to do any evaluation here. We do need viable options to address our interests but we really don't wanna to think too much about the constraints or start evaluating if people's ideas are good or bad because if we explore ideas together creatively, we may innovate our way around a lot of constraints and things that we didn't think was possible. A lot of our entrenched processes and procedures, somebody talked about that in the chat. We might innovate around that together. So we don't wanna shoot down any ideas here, but we're also not making any commitment here. Our goal is just to curate a ridiculously large set of options and explore possibilities. Uh, look, every idea has at least some merit, even if it's ridiculous. Um, here's an example. We were facilitating a union negotiation yeah. and um, the, the management team, they were getting frustrated because um, the employees union, they, just, they were just asking for a ridiculous amount of money. And one of the, the uh, labor management guys, he stood up like he was Bob Barker on The Price is Right. And he was like, why doesn't everyone get a new car? And all of a sudden, everyone was like, well, oh, hey, you know, compensation doesn't have to be just money. Maybe there's some intangibles. And, and they wound up innovating off of that. It was a ridiculous suggestion. Of course, they did not adopt it. But out of a ridiculous suggestion, people started thinking about non-tangible compensation as well. Uh, so no idea is a bad idea at exploring options because you never know where it leads to. You know, I can think of another example where um, they were talking about compensation and somebody suggested one of the options was um, a 24% increase, which would be, you know, virtually unheard of, but they were able to negotiate something that we, we wouldn't have anticipated because it wasn't the evaluation phase. It was everything is on the table. Yeah, sure. And, you know, so to that end, fill up the options list. And, and as you cultivate more and more options, more ideas will come. And, and that's where we get a lot of fertile territory in these, you know, regional partnerships, all partnerships, um, to just brainstorm and be creative. But once we do that, and you get a ridiculous list, I mean, we've seen lists be like 35 and 40 options long, and, and we only need one. Um, look, we got to get into evaluation at some point. But so someone had asked earlier about like that power dynamic. What if somebody comes in and, and you know, they just want to bulldoze their way through this? Well, okay, we'll add their option to our list of 30. And now we'll evaluate it. So in the evaluation phase, we're going to look at every single option on the list. And we have some evaluation criteria we're going to apply. We're going to go back to our list of issues, interests, and constraints. There was a reason we started there. A little boring, I know, but there was a purpose. And that's because now we can take the options and go back and say, all right, option number one, does it meet our interests? Does it satisfy the constraints we're facing? 
Are we legally allowed to do it? I like to use the evaluation criteria. Uh, is it saleable? Can we sell this to the region? Can we go back and sell it to our board? Could we sell it to the legal department? <laughs> All right. So you know, we're not breaking any laws here, just to be clear. But so we apply evaluation criteria in an objective way. And so if somebody comes out with a ridiculous idea and they try to force it on a partnership, it's never going to make it past evaluation because it doesn't meet the interests of the entire group. Interestingly, out of evaluation, we can create new options. And so I see this happen sometimes where, you know, people will be nitpicking and say, hey, you know, I like option seven, but it doesn't meet all of our interests. What if we married it to option 11? And bam, we just, we birthed a brand new option. Option 31 is to merge seven and 11. All right, so some of that kind of creativity happens when you're evaluating too. And then of course, the real value of the evaluation phase is it's gonna eliminate the overwhelming majority of the options up on the board. And out of 10, 15, 30 options, it's gonna whittle us down to two or three. So that brings us to a commitment phase. You're going to know out of that conversation, out of working through that evaluation process, which of these options are actually meeting all of our needs, addressing our interests, satisfy our constraints, and actually solves the problem we stated back at the beginning when we named our issues. So when we get into commitment seeking, it's about the consensus. Now look, you are not going to get everything you want all the time. That's the reality of partnership work and that's okay. Look, you probably don't agree with everything I've said here today. That's also okay. But you know what? I bet we align on quite a few of these ideas. And that's the goal of this interest-based model is where do we align at? And out of 20 options, we found two that could work and one of them that meets the vast majority of our needs. We've just found consensus. It doesn't necessarily even have to be your best or preferred option, but it's the one that meets the needs of the group. And we're all going to vote on that. So the way that it works is we've whittled our options down to two or three. We've talked about it. We've found one that we think meets all of our needs. And you know what happens? I'll say, I'd like to suggest we vote on option 31, mm -hmm. where seven and 11 were merged together. Right. All right, everybody, give me a thumbs up, thumbs sideways, thumbs down. What do you think on? on this option. Anyone that raises their thumb up, that's a yes vote. Anyone that raises their thumb or puts it sideways, that's a neutral vote. Anyone that votes it down, they're saying no way. So in this process, the burden is on someone who rejects this option to tell us why. We're okay having that conversation. All right, you don't like option 31, but now the burden's on you. You can't just take your ball and go home because you didn't get everything you want. And this is what I was talking about earlier, where you know the power is really neutralized in this because we're serving the needs of the region, right? If you said no, you got to tell us why. And you either have to tell us what has to change in order to make it where you would vote for it or give us a counter proposal of a new option that addresses your needs. And so it really prevents the system from getting um, blocked uh, where someone had said like they just won't work with us, right? It prevents that from happening. I would say that it's less than 2% of the time when we've been facilitating. Would you agree with that? Yeah, that's pretty accurate. Yeah, I would say less than 2% of the time we get to this phase and someone votes no. Because by the time you've had all these conversations through the other five phases, we've worked through all the problems by now. It's incredibly rare that we get to this point and we have not honed in on the best possible option for today. Now, all that this means when you vote for it, whether a thumbs up or a thumb sideways, what you're saying is you agree this is the best possible decision this group is capable of making today with the resources, with the constraints. This is the best we can do today. And we're all gonna walk out of this room saying this is the best we could do today. Now, it doesn't mean we don't come back in a month or in three months. We're definitely going to wind up renegotiating and revisiting all of the things that we agree to in our regions. But for today, we've made some progress. We've all found an option that meets our needs, and we can move forward feeling good about it. So, so those six phases make up the model. This is the interest-based model. And, and so we baked in a couple of minutes here. We've got about 10 minutes left. I think I've got maybe two slides. So I think we have time for a question or two, Elaine. So I have one question here that says, um, how do you move, how do you keep the group moving forward and coming up with the ideas 
that gets you to choosing the right idea for addressing an issue? All right. So, um, well, first, a shameless plug uh, for our next webinar, right? So June said this is a three-part series. So um, in our part two, which is going to be on February 8th, we're going to take a deep dive on how we explore options in a way that brings us mutual gain. So um, mark your calendars. It, it'll be a good day where we, you know, we really get creative and explore options there. Um, I would frame this question a little bit differently where I would say, how do we move from exploring options over to making a commitment? That's what it sounds like you're asking to me. So my short answer is, well, um, you, you skipped step five, which is evaluation, right? So, um, so two things. One, the model bakes it in there. You're going to know when you're done exploring options because you'll feel the energy in the room kind of subside. People start getting quiet. We've exhausted all of our creativity. And that's part of the point is that every idea that everyone in the room has is going to get voiced in this model. There's a lot of value in that. You're going to be heard. And when we run out of things to say, we're done exploring options and it's time to move into evaluation. Um, so, you know, but the evaluation portion of it is what gets us to the commitment. It's what gets us to a choice. We're going to whittle all the options down to two or three. And through those conversations, we will have poked holes in everything that was fallible. And we're going to pretty clearly see what's the right choice to address. Well, in our case, we were talking about recruitment, right? Um, so that's how you kind of transition and get over um, into selecting your choice. And so we're kind of getting stuck on what happens if someone shows up with positioning. Okay, so I know, I know. Listen, our entire lives, uh, look, we live in a capitalist society, guys. And I'm not here to argue the merits or faults of that. But that the, the reason we're getting hung up on positionality is because in our society, that's the way it works. We live in a competitive society. We're trained to compete and defend our positions and our homes and our families and our livelihoods. And it's, it, this is a really foreign concept. We're asking people to come together and work for the better good. And that's not something that we see. But, you know, let me say it this way as well. It's okay to have a position. I, in fact, you know what? I have a position right now. I, I'm driving a car. It's, it's an old car. It's a little car. I don't like my car. I have a position. If Elon Musk called me up right now and said, hey, Joe, guess what? I, I would really like you to take this car for free. Can you please take this free Tesla? My position is I would, I would gladly accept a free Tesla. Anybody out there got one for me? If you do, hit me up in the chat. It's not showing up in the chat, Joe. That's, that's a shame. So, so I do have a position. Um, hey, Elaine, we're going to come in tomorrow and talk about your salary. Sweet. Um, yep. So I'm going to be, my position is I'd like you to take a 50% pay cut. Not sweet. So how do you feel about that? Uh, my position is that I'm going to go work for June. Okay. So <laughs> <laughs> June, you do not get to scout my talent. All right. So Elaine has a position as well. Her position is she will not accept a pay cut. Well, certainly not a 50% one. It's okay to have a position. In fact, I want you all to have positions. And we'll talk here. Maybe we should just move on to the next slide here because we need to develop positions. We need to know what we want before we can know why we want it. It's okay to have a position. Our point is in this process, you're not negotiating from a position because you're not married to a particular idea and that would get you entrenched. So there's a little bit of work that we have to do before we get into this, uh, this model. And part of that is these getting ready processes. So in getting ready, these are preparations. You've got to establish your process, your ground rules, your goals. Yes, figure out your positions. And then you need to make a list of why you care about that position, because those are your interests, right? So you're going to do this work together but you're also gonna be taking it back in a pre-planning phase where you work with your own team at your organization and you guys talk about what do we need, what do we want and why do we want it? You're gonna be naming your topics, your issues and your interests. You're gonna be doing that work on your own back at your institution. And then you come together for joint planning together with your region. So we talked about people are forming regional councils, regional committees. You bring all that information from getting ready and from pre-planning so that you're able to contribute to the group and say, hey, at Seminole State, here's what we see as the problems. Here are the issues around it. Here's our interests. And yeah, I've got a position. Here's my idea for how to solve it, but I'm not married to it. I'd like to hear your ideas. Mm -hmm. And maybe Carrie Ann from Daytona State, she has different interests and we can co-innovate an idea to solve them both. So 
it's baked into the process to work through some of those challenges. Now, the implementation of the interest-based model kind of takes three components to it. So there is definitely a training component. If this is something that you want to see happen, we suggest you engage in some training with your regional members. Um, and you know, there's a facilitation element about this because there's unique characteristics around each institution and the goals that you have, the power dynamics you've talked about. But you know, people diving into the work of innovating, it helps to have a neutral facilitator with expertise in interest-based bargaining and project management that can kind of keep people on track and let the group innovate without having to worry so much about the process. Um, and then when it comes to implementation, you know, things can get going pretty rapidly with your regions. Um, identifying your parties and, and getting them exposed to the interest-based model goes a long ways. And to that end, you know, we think it'd be a great idea for you to broach this topic with your regional partners. How are you going to do this collaborative work in a way that builds relationships for the long term? Not going in to get a short-term victory at everyone's expense because mm -hmm. that's going to destroy your relationships yeah. and your region has to still thrive for years on end here. If you feel compelled, refer your colleagues to this webinar. It's going to be recorded and posted on June's IP Day site. Um, so while we close out here, Elaine, you got some more work to do here. Guys, if anything resonated, what resonated from today's session with you? What do you think you could bring into your region? What would you like to learn more about? with bargaining and, and interest-based models. Hit the chat up, give Elaine something to do over here, help her out. <laughs> All right, if, um, if you're uh, coming back uh, in a couple of weeks, part two for uh, our webinar series on these topics, we'll be exploring options on February 8th, and we're gonna get into some of those battles, the bad behaviors of negotiating on March 1st. Uh, if you're going to find yourself up at Nashville for INSET or at UPSIA or COABE, we'll be there. Look up our live sessions. We'd love to see you. And we would love to continue the conversation with you. So there's the dates. There's the titles for our upcoming webinars. That QR code, um, if you'd like to talk with us more, we'd love to have you. Uh, feel free to hit that QR code. It'll take you over to a site that has a Contact Us page. We'd love to chat with you about what you got going on with your projects. If you want to talk about your action plans or where you see things going or want to learn more about these models and uh, our contact information uh, is there as well. Um, Elaine, any thoughts, questions, anything else out of the chat you want to bring to the group's attention? Yeah, I'm going to let you read this one. This one's good. Uh-oh, right where's here. it at? All right, it says, uh, uh, which one? Show me. Need glasses? Uh, well, my eyes are, I mean, come on. Uh, April Mesa with Future Makers Coalition in Southwest Florida, our backbone organization, Southwest Florida Community Foundation, changed their name to Collaboratory because collaboration is the only way to create true and impactful change. Yeah, you're 100% right. Uh, it says organizations trying to save the world from their own silo is the problem. These issues aren't easy to solve, but this is the way to do it. Yeah, thanks so much, April. You're 100% right. And this is, you know, the work that, that Elaine and I do, uh, you know, yes, we're administrators. Yes, we're teachers, but we also spend a lot of time working on collaboration models and helping organizations and partnerships find their footing. So uh, guys, thank you so much for joining us here. I think I'm going to turn it back over to June to close us out and uh, look forward to talking to you guys soon. Thank you so much, Joe and Elaine. And thank you all for your comments, That the, those positive comments. We really appreciate that. Right now you see a, a survey that is on your screen. Take a minute to scroll through these questions. You have to scroll to the, I think there's about six questions here. Go ahead and answer them and take a minute to do so. Your feedback and your voice is so important to us. So we really would like to know how you felt about this webinar. While you do that, I'm going to remind you that we have a webinar Wednesday next week, January 25th, and the webinar is titled Fostering Learner Agencies in the Adult ESOL Class, Voice, Choice, and Equity. So I hope you will join us and your staff will join us. Until then, I wish you a really great rest of your day today and thank you so much for all that you do for adult education.